Hello and welcome to another edition of D&D Stories. I am your host, Rob, from the Channel Performance Check, and this is the show where I regale you with tales that are told from the hit role-playing game Dungeons and & Dragons and sometimes Pathfinder. This is a standalone episode, uh, which I don't think I've actually done yet in this season of D&D Stories. And the reason being is because we're going to take a little bit of a break from the story arcs involving Valdane and uh, Droskor and Theodrex and Barnaby and all those characters, essentially, uh, because it's nice to break it up. And I have been meaning to do an episode on two characters that were briefly mentioned in one episode of the previous story arc, The Eighth Gate. These two characters are known as Eviscerus and Israfil. They were played by myself and my friend Dom in the absence of Matt from the regular campaign. So rather than sidelining Matt's character, we just decided to start a whole new one. My friend Mike decided he was going to DM an evil campaign. Uh, and Eviscerus and Israfil, these two terrifying individuals, were responsible for the fall of Agistel, the annex of Agistel as it went to be known by through the history books of Main Realm. And this is really just a neat little way for me to tell you all about these characters that I hold very close to my heart, but also start with the caveat that they were horrendous people <laughs> and did some really awful things, uh, but all in the name of power and reputation. And indeed, it was power and reputation that these two uh, terrible souls were able to accrue. Eviscerus was a Duskblade, a warrior that could channel dark magics through his terrifyingly strong and large greatsword. And there was Israfil, a Blackguard, a fallen paladin who would use the power of Vecna, the Keeper of Secrets to channel dark energies and curses into his weapons before striking his enemies cruelly down. Together they both operate under a single moniker, a single idea, a single name that has ravaged the land of Main Realm and strikes fear into the hearts of any who hear it. This is the tale of the Scourge. This terrible story begins like many stories begin in the world known as Main Realm. A mercenary company made up of five members who operate under the ideal and the motto that if you want power, you must claim it. These mercenaries decided that they were going to take the greatest power on offer to them. Each one of these mercenaries were high-level characters, level 15 at the lowest. And the reason is simply because our other characters had been level 15 at the point that this new campaign had started. So we were used to sort of that, you know, level of play. And we wanted to face some really epic challenges. And this manifested in a opportunity for this mercenary group very early in the game. Now, bear in mind this is sort of like the prologue to the main campaign. Only two of those characters were player characters. That was Viscerous and that was Israfil. The other three were NPCs that were only briefly described, but these five made up a, uh, a terrifying... Um, a terrifying company that it had been whispered were known as the Scourge. And they decided that they were going to take power from a source of bountiful uh, amount. They decided that they were going to face a threat to the world and be paid handsomely to do it. Within the Endless Rockin, a great mountain range that basically divides Main Realm in half, within the Endless Rockin, rumours had begun to circulate that a cult of a terrible and terrifying god had begun to operate and uh, 
basically started kidnapping people and taking people into the mountains. Now, this is a problem for the surrounding settlements that are being prey to this cult, so mercenaries were hired, and it just so happened that it is our mercenaries that get the job. And they discover that these cultists serve none other than the terrifying dragon god herself, Tiamat. Or goddess, I should say. Tiamat, the five-headed, terrifying leviathan of a dragon queen, uh, is being resurrected within a hallowed and terrifying horde uh, within the mountains. This, uh, this great dragon's lair. So, the Scourge decide that they're going to be paid a handsome amount to dispatch the cultists and stop this from happening. And when they arrive, they are confronted with a terrifying truth. Tiamat is a goddess, and as such, goddesses in well this particular setting are able to have avatars of themselves that they use to walk the earth. We like to imagine that Tiamat was so powerful that this... You know, this five-headed draconic goddess has descended to, like, uh, a celestial plane long, long ago. So, Tiamat is more of a, an overseeing god than a singular entity. However, uh, that it can manifest. She can manifest into a singular entity by use of this avatar, which has appeared within this great horde, this great uh, dragon pit, this terrifying lair. Filled with treasures and uh, magical items. The Scourge fight through cultists and uh, terrifying monsters summoned by the evil dragon goddess. And they reach the Avatar. And in a climactic battle, the mercenary squad, known as the Scourge, were dispatched. Three of them, at least. Two survived. And it was... Eviscerus and Israfil, who escaped with their lives. Now, neither Eviscerus or Israfil take defeat particularly well. They are very sore losers, and as there are now only two of them, they decide that they're just going to operate as a duo and work together to claim the power that they both so covet. And they decide that they're going to do anything that they can to basically gain three things. Money, reputation, power. That is the MO of the Scourge. And it's why I'm going to be telling you this story in a very, well, I say very different way, just in a slightly different way. And that is because, essentially, <laughs> this, there isn't so much a story as a number of tasks that we as evil characters went to fulfill to slowly build an empire. The, Scour the Scourge realised that they need more than just them. They need soldiers, they need magical items, they need a hold fast, they need all sorts of things to achieve the vision that they see for themselves. They want to take power by any means necessary. So that means for them to start again from the very beginning. The first thing they need is money. Now there are lots of ways that you can earn money in the hit role playing game Dungeons and Dragons. You can go on adventures and mercenary quests and things like that. The Scourge decided that they wanted to earn money big, and to be fair, they didn't have much stipulation as to what they would do to earn that money. And so it is, we begin the first of this series of missions that the Scourge go upon to achieve. Remember, money, reputation, power. The Scourge get an offer from a leader of a great town within the centre of a part of main realm known as the Middenlands. And this uh, lord of this town essentially approaches the Scourge, telling them that he would like them to be in charge of an operation to disband a town of halflings that have essentially their residence upriver from this great town. Now the reason this lord wants these halflings gone from their fine, beautiful village of Sandybank. They want them gone because they need to build a massive dam. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Middlelands have an issue with great floods that come down from the mountains when there's heavy rainfall. 
And so this is damaging crops, this is affecting livestock, it's basically screwing the town out of a lot of money and the Lord has had enough. And he has had to try very hard to negotiate with these halflings to see if they wouldn't mind, you know, uprooting their lives and moving because Sandy Bank, where they live, is positioned where you would need the dam to go. And obviously the halflings have been there for a hundred years and, you know, don't want to move. Uh, it's only really the big town that gets affected. It isn't their village. The, the river just torrents by and the water collects further down from them. Uh, so it's just a bit of an issue for this, this town. And so this lord one day makes a dark deal with the Scourge who arrive within this town to dispatch or disband the uh, the halfling village. And this is a skill that they will use later on when they go to Adastel and annex Adastel just the pair, with just the two of them. Uh, first of all, they need to get rid of this village of halflings. And so one day this uh, farmer, this uh, halfling farmer, is basically working the crops, minding his own business, when all of a sudden upon the horizon he sees two dark figures approaching. They both wear terrifying black armour and have long black cloaks and terrifying weapons at their sides. Eviscerous the Duskblade looks to the halfling and says, You there, little one, tell me, who is your leader? Who is the chief of this beautiful little town we have so fortunately come across by chance and Eviscerus like just smiles at uh, Israel who is like slowly circling the halfling at this point and this farmer literally hasn't seen like warriors of this caliber before in his life so he's just like forget my language but shitting himself like he's like what the fuck and this halfling is just staring up and he says, well, that'll be the chief. He resides in uh, the mustering hall at the centre of town. Just follow the river. And the two terrifying warriors just grin evilly down upon the halfling and say, thank you very much for your service. There is one final thing that we will require from you <laughs> this day, poor little halfling. And the halfling is like, what do you mean? And Eviscera simply seizes the halfling by the throat and marches to the river, burying the, uh, the, this, this farmer's face into the water, just straight down and drowns the halfling basically instantly. And the two of them retreat into the, <laughs> into the woods before anyone can see this happen. They basically just murdered this halfling for, well, reasons that will become apparent. And they take him off into the woods. Uh, they then return to the town under the, uh, you know, and, you know, they haven't been found. So, like, there's no real panic. But people are noticing that these, that these two warriors are now walking to the centre of town after. So I'm laughing, but it's really, really mean. Um, they walk into the centre of town and they go to this mustering hall and they appear before the chief and the chief's like, it's strange we don't have visitors of your ilk that often. And Israfil the black guard just gives an evil smile and says, no, I can see as much. Do you have any militia or anyone to defend the borders of this fair town? What was the name again? Um, uh, Sandybank, says the, uh, the, the chief. And, uh, Israel says Sandy Bank. Such a quaint name. It would be such a such a terrible shame. Such a terrible shame if this beautiful place were to be blemished. We bring word, Chief, we bring word that a great curse is falling across the land, and we had wanted to warn you. In fact, we wanted to offer your uh, our services to protect this divine and beautiful and tranquil place from such evil and the chief's like well what do you mean what kind of curse and uh you know eviscerous takes over and he says well my dear chief it is a very complicated matter and something that i'm sure you would not understand from being raised in such an idyllic place I shouldn't wonder that there are many dark mysteries in this world that you wouldn't be able to fathom. The halfling chief is wrapped with attention. He can't take his eyes off these two terrifying individuals who then inform him that they will protect 
his town, his uh, his little village from this terrible curse, and they'll do it free of charge from the goodness of their own hearts. And they praise be to these two strangers that have come to help their town and defend them from this curse. But of course, the curse is a plan of the Scourge's own making. Well, of course it is. But no curse is going to descend upon this land. No, the curse is going to manifest in a different manner. The Scourge say that they will return to the village in three days. And in three days, all the villagers who wish to be defended from this curse are to drink from the well. In the meantime, they must satisfy their thirst and anything else that they need water for by uh, for getting from the river. So the chief accepts, saying that none of, his, none of the village people will, uh, the village people, not the band, none of the people from the village uh, will uh, drink from the well. And then, under the cover of darkness, Israfil and Eviserus return to the town and they bring the body, the body that they've left to putrefy and be slightly fed upon by leaving it in the forest. They mutter dark incantations and Israfil, who uses, you know, a dark god's power, is able to blemish the corpse of this farmer with a horrendous disease. And then... Still in the dead of night, they hurl this uh, dead farmer deep into the well with stones tied around him so he will sink and not be seen from the surface. Three days pass and the scourge return to the town, the village, sorry, and state, Now you must drink, and drink deep. We have been able to put a charm upon your well, a charm that will defend you from the coming darkness. <laughs> they just maintain that. I will point out that whenever they, they're talking to people, they always have like that look upon their eyes, like hungry, evil, and they want to kill you. The thing is, the Scourge at any point could have just drawn their weapons and slaughtered the town easily. They could just kill them with uh, brute force. But the factor of the matter is, is that they enjoy the deception. They enjoy toying with people. This is a uh, sport for them. This is, uh, you know, they, they want to take pride and uh, they want to enjoy their work. And this is the way that they, <laughs> they enjoy doing their work. And so every halfling within the village of Sandybank drink deeply from the well. And it isn't long before the signs of disease begin to become apparent within the tranquil town. The halfling chief uh, staggers from the mustering hall like he looks to be the only person who hasn't been affected and he says I took great caution I thought there was something wrong with you and I wasn't going to drink from the well ah but you made the rest of your people drink from the well says Eviserus eyeing the halfling with disgust and the halfling says please you said you were going to protect us from the darkness we are the darkness Eviserus says and he cuts the halfling chief's legs off I'm serious he just cuts his legs off Bam! <laughs> the, uh, they slowly bleed him as he is the only halfling left alive and they decide that they're going to, you know, test their palate, as it were. As the halflings are indeed a different species, it would not in fact be cannibalism if they were to decide to have a little bit of a bite. So they decide to bleed the halfling chief dry and then put him on the spit to cook. They try him and don't find it a particularly nice taste, but they don't want to waste a good meal, so they finish up and return back to the town. The lord of the town welcomes them and says, Ah, well, thank you ever so much, gentlemen, for performing this... <sighs> sorry, sorry duty, but it had to be done. Might I ask, were they amicable in the end? Were you able to arrange a deal of some kind? And Eviscera says, we were able to... Dispatch them without using any of the funds that you suggested might be available to them. And the Lord says, oh, well, that's very good. Then that will go towards your reward then in that case. Very good, says Eviserus. However, there has been a slight change of plan. What do you mean? Says the Lord of the town. I thought we had a deal. I am altering the deal, <laughs> says Eviserus. Pray, I do not alter it further. And uh, they basically state that now they want double what uh, they were told they were going to receive. And the Lord says, well, I simply cannot pay. All, all of that uh, money will be required to build the dam in the first place. We only have so much to give. 
And Eviscera smiles and looks to Israfil, who once again begins walking around behind the Lord of the Town. But the Lord of the Town has guards, and they begin to get ready for what looks to be an escalating threat. It is a few hours later, and the town is now blazing beautifully. Nearly every single building is on fire as the Scourge unleashes their full power against the town militia, the Lord, and in fact anyone else who stands in their way. There are a number of adventurers who rise to the call to try and stop the Scourge in their efforts of completely wiping out and sacking the city. The Scourge feel that if they've done it to Sandy Bank, well they might as well just help themselves to all of the wealth within this town rather than just taking you know, the money that they were getting paid to do. Uh, the, the money that they were, you know, being given for the job, rather, of taking out Sandy Bank. And now they're just taking out this town and they wipe the streets clean of any who would oppose them. There are a few buildings that, le that are left, you know, standing. And Viserys and Israfil stand before one with a sign that blows in the wind, the, uh, the cold wind that begins to... Uh, come in from the, uh, the valleys that surround this place and on that sign is written simply orphanage Eviscerus and Israfel walk into the orphanage and there are a number of terrified children gathered in a corner looking at these two warriors they see the smoke blazing from nearly every building that surrounds them in this area of the town and honestly they're of very terrified. You would be very terrified. But the Scourge step forward and say, We need one volunteer. And a brave child by the name of Carl stands forth and says, Please don't hurt us. And uh, Israfil looks to uh, Eviscerus, who gives a, um, a satisfied nod. And he says, You are a brave child. You shall be spared. You shall be brought with us. We shall teach you the ways of the world. We shall teach you how to truly succeed. But but what about the others? They shall live, says Eviscerus. I want them to grow up understanding exactly what kind of world they're going to be living in now. The orphanage will stand. <laughs> like, I'm serious. The Scourge are like, they want to make sure that their reputation spreads far and wide for years to come. So why not start early and fill the hearts of all children that behold them with fear? But they don't kill them. You know, we don't go too far in this game. Admittedly, we have killed and eaten a halfling. But there isn't the, the wanton slaughter of children because keeping them alive it actually serves their purpose more so there we go uh but they have this one child that they decide to name their ward carl and carl is now uh, <laughs> asked essentially like some poor dickensian orphan to basically undergo all the tasks that the scourge don't want to do themselves he becomes sort of like their squire carrying around all equipment that they rob and take from uh, the settlements and surrounding areas of the Midlands. And so it is that the name of the Scourge begins to spread across the Midlands and across all realms of main realm. Uh, their reputation is growing as is their power and as is their wealth. They basically just sack places left and right, just accruing as much money as possible because, you know, we try and make money in the good campaign and we have to do that by doing dutiful uh, quests and earning it whereas the scourge just see that you know everywhere in on the map basically is an opportunity to make coin and you know allow the fear of their name to grow the scourge cutting swathes across the land and reaving as they see fit does not go unnoticed for too long and it is when they are set upon by hero after hero, adventurer after adventurer, that the Scourge begin to realise that, you know, they're getting to the point where they need to get to. They have become the main villains of this part of Main Realm. And many, many forces are sent to try and take them out, and some of them are almost successful. And it is at this point that Eviscerus and Israfil decide that they're going to need a keep. They're going to need somewhere where they can, that they can call a base so they can protect themselves. So they 
look upon their map of the area and they see towards the borders of the Endless Rock and that great mountain range that I had mentioned before from their past, they see that there is a ominous looking structure known as the Black Tower. And yes, the Scourge are highly stereotypically evil, so of course they want the Black Tower to be their keep. They want it to be their domain. So they journey to this Black Tower and upon arrival discover that the cultists of Tiamat reside there. And they see that this is an ample chance, an ample opportunity for revenge. <laughs> Now, the Scourge have felt the bitter sting of defeat once before, and they do not wish to feel it ever again, so they decide that they're going to carefully plan how they're going to take the Black Tower from these cultists of Tiamat. And so they retreat back to civilization, and for once, they decide to uh, keep it subtle and enter a particular town home to a powerful wizard by the name of Merrick. The Scourge have done their research and they know that Merrick has been working on creating a phylactery. He is very focused on the necromantic arts and this is a power that the Scourge wish to um, take in and involve in their strategy. And so they arrive and hold Merrick hostage. Essentially they, they, they find out where he is and they bust down the door and they are able to overpower him uh, before he can really do any lasting uh, magical damage to them. Uh, they then proceed to beat him uh, to an inch of his life and they claim all of his hard work uh, and research for themselves. Uh, and they learned that Merrick was very close to being able to create a phylactery. And so using this research, they're allowed to do some modifications to this phylactery, whereby as soon as Merrick is slain, he will return as a lich. He will become a lich, a powerful uh, lich that could uh, bring uh, an entire graveyard back uh, from the, uh, the other side. Uh, but the, the difference being is that whilst that phylactery is in the possession of the Scourge, they can conduct him to essentially be like a general, like a lich general that they control. Uh, and after making these adjustments, a ceremony is held where Merrick is ritually slaughtered. Uh, Israfil basically plunges his great sword into his back like that way soldier execution style uh and then they have themselves a general and it is not long before merrick the lich is now being used to summon an unearthly army to help the scourge take the black tower a legion of zombies ghouls spirits ghosts and undead nightmares crash against the wall of the Black Tower. It is a modest keep despite its grand and ominous name, uh, uh, but it can withstand quite a lot. It is a incredibly well made and well positioned strategic point and this is why the Scourge want it as long, along with the fact that it's called the Black Tower. Um, and Essentially, whilst the undead forces are distracting the cultists uh, of Tiamat that hold this place, the two warriors, that is Israfil and Eviserus, they basically get teleported behind the walls by their, uh, by their lich. Their puppet lich, that was right, I forgot about that. They call him the puppet lich because they could, well, they bent him to their will, essentially. But they're teleported behind the walls and that is exactly where they need to be because they want to open the gates. So Eviserus and Israfil basically clean house on this castle. They're just wasting no time putting the sword to every pathetic, horrendous looking cult of Tiamat down. They just fucking slaughtered them. Uh, Eviserus is channeling vampiric touch through his blade. So essentially every time he's hitting someone uh, he's and doing damage, he's taking that as HP, like he steals temporary hit points. So he's like a juggernaut that just cannot 
be brought down because every time he attacks, he gets health back. And Israfil fights with a terrifying grace. He can use the Shadow Step ability to teleport behind his enemies and cut their throats. He channels dark powers into horrendous, corrupting smites. And it isn't long before the battle is in their, uh, in their way. It's going their way. And they are able to open the gates. And remember, this is the problem with fighting uh, the undead or necromancers: is this that, you know, as, as your enemies fall, they then become part of the army that is trying to destroy you. So all of the dead of the, uh, the cultists are being raised and now fighting for the Scourge. Meanwhile, in some other terrifying realm of existence, the goddess of uh, chromatic dragons, uh, the evil goddess Tiamat, is noticing that her cultists are being wiped out by this weird collection of these these well these two warriors leading this undead army, and she doesn't take too kindly to that. And it's almost as if she sees through the fates and witnesses that these are the two that survived the last onslaught of her avatar. And so Tiamat descends and her avatar appears on main realm once again. Upon the walls of the Black Tower. And this time the Scourge are ready for her. For dramatic effects, I didn't divulge entirely the length of time that the Scourge took to prepare for this attack upon the Black Tower. We spent session after session ensuring that we could use our puppet Lich to the best of our ability, and that meant raising a lot of forces. Uh, there is a surprise force in reserve of just zombies uh, and more powerful things like phantoms and wraiths as well that then descend upon the Black Tower. And they are led by the Pies de Resistance. Uh, Israfil and Eviscerus had explored the Endless Rocken to scout out what advantageous territories that they could utilize in this fight. And they had stumbled across a fallen dragon, the remains of a colossal dragon from way back in the old walls of Zorvintal. And they had their puppet lich bring this dragon back from the other side, a Draco Lich. This Draco Lich leads this reserve force and smashes into the side of Tiamat, not needing to overcome any of those fear effects, you know, like terrifying presence, because they're undead, they aren't afraid. Lots of research was done into the, what could really be effective against Tiamat, the avatar of Tiamat at least, and that was one of the big problems. Everything's just going to be terrified of her. Undead have no problem with just wrecking shop, and they just fall upon Tiamat and are all over her. As the two characters, the Scourge, strike against her. The battle rocks the very landscape as this godly creature just unleashes hell back at the waves of undead that clash against her avatar. And the Scourge are struggling in this fight, but more or less holding their own as well. They aren't immediately dead, put it that way. A lot of preparation and a lot of buffing went into them. They were ensured that they had uh, protection against the elements. So the breath weapons weren't going to be as effective against them. And uh, they'd had all sorts of uh, boons to their reflex save so they could hurl themselves out of the way of the many different different breath effects as well. You know, like it's just nuts fighting team at the amount of firepower that comes your way. But regardless, the fight is long and arduous and epic. And towards the very end of it, we see the Scourge atop one of these... Uh, pinnacles of the Black Tower uh, doing battle with the Tiamat as it's basically wiped out most of the undead. The undead were really a, like a, a distraction, a powerful distraction nonetheless. Uh, the Drekulich has been like eradicated and finally a killing blow is delivered. 
the colossal head of the black dragon of Tiamat arcs above Aviserus, opens its jaws wide, and unleashes a torrent of acid breath down upon him. And Aviserus is just standing there, arms wide, and just takes it, and he just screams, Aah! But he still stands. <laughs> Eviscerus had absorbed so many temporary hit points from the fight, he essentially could take the full damage and it not be that much of a problem. And while his armour is burning away, the Dusk Blade reaches his blade into the air upon high. An arc of lightning rains from the sky, connecting with the blade, charging it with chain lightning, and he delivers it painfully and excruciatingly into the heart of Tiamat's avatar. And the vile creature just whirls about, screaming breath weapons, blazing into the sky as it collapses from the top of this keep down into the courtyard below and is destroyed. As the dust settles, it is apparent that this victory for the Scourge is but the first step towards something far greater. In destroying the avatar of Tiamat, they have stolen a portion of her power. The Scourge have taken their first steps to godhood. How those powers manifest and how that dark journey truly descends into chaos and madness, well, you're just going to have to find out next time on the next exciting edition of D&D Stories. Thank you very much for watching and look out for The Scourge Part 2. Remember, keep gaming. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out the D&D Stories Facebook, Patreon, and t-shirts on Redbubble. Keep gaming!